Hey guys, this is Andy Bird. I am so excited to jump into this series on revival history. Today we are jumping right in with a story of Count Zinzendorf and the Moravians. This is an incredible story with so much application to our own lives. Count Zinzendorf is a man of wealth and prestige. He has everything according to the success of his day. Yet he also has a dream, he has a promise and a prophecy over his life. And his willingness and his ability to step into that is going to be directly related to the size of the yes in his heart and his willingness to obey God versus chasing the success of society. His yes to a group of refugees that have moved onto his land, his yes to move in and get his hands dirty, believing that what seemed like nothing in its early days was going to turn into something that would literally shape all of human history, that yes would become the most important yes of his life. All right, as we jump in today, let me give you three things to look for in this story. Number one, don't underestimate the power of a simple yes. God is looking for people who are simply willing to say yes. Number two is right on the other side of that yes, which feels like great faith and great risk, is the power of God waiting to meet us and to move beyond our wildest imagination. His power is like a magnet that is absolutely drawn to the yes and the obedience in the human heart. Number three is we're going to talk about the power of gritty, enduring intercession. No move of God in history, no great move of the kingdom has really ever occurred apart from gritty, intercession. Okay, let's jump into this story. Count Zinzendorf is a really unique guy. He's born into wealth, he's born into influence, but he also has this incredible love for Jesus at an incredibly young age. Five, six, seven years old, he's writing love letters to Jesus. In his teen years, he's in school, he starts this gathering called the Order of the Mustard Seed, which later would spread around the world as uh, religious and political figures would give their lives and kind of take this pledge to use their influence for the sake of the kingdom. He starts that in his teen years, but really the first major defining moment of his life comes in his early 20s, late teens, where he's at an art museum and he's looking at this incredible painting called Eke Homo, which means behold the man. And it's Jesus with the crown of thorns on his head and he's just scanning the painting, just mesmerized by the sacrifice and the love of Jesus. And as he, his eyes get to the bottom of the painting, he sees this little inscription that says, all this I have done for you, what will you do for me? This was Zinzendorf's first really like all in moment where he realizes his wealth and his influence is not just for his personal comfort. It's not just for future generations, but that it was meant for the kingdom and it was meant for now. And that if Jesus could pay that price on the cross, how much more in a way was Zinzendorf meant to respond to that by going all in for Jesus? Just a couple years later, fast forward, as Zinzendorf has a divine appointment. And I just want to say many of our life stories, we look back, they're marked by divine appointments. But many times it doesn't feel that divine in the moment. It might feel like a disruption, might feel a little uncomfortable, might feel like, who is this person that God's brought into my life? But Zinzendorf has a divine appointment with a man named Christian David. Christian David is a refugee fleeing religious persecution. He comes into what's present day Germany, uh, running for his life, and his people, his friends, his family, and this whole group of followers of Jesus had been persecuted for several generations. They actually could trace their lineage all the way back to Jan Hus, one of the great reformers. And so Christian David uh, finds his way into Germany, stumbles onto Zinzendorf's estate. And they kind of connect, and Zinzendorf hears the story of Christian David and that he's fleeing religious persecution, says to him, hey, you can come and live on my land. And they walk up to this hill between Zinzendorf's town and his little home and his kind of wealthy estate and this patch of forest on the other side of the hill. Zinzendorf looks down on that patch of forest with Christian David and said, let's build a community here. You can bring these re refugees to this area that are fleeing persecution. They can come and live in safety. And for Zinzendorf, this is sort of his like all in. This is his moment from the painting where he's thinking, I'm using my wealth in order to further the kingdom. But in many ways, this was the easiest yes that Zinzendorf would say. 
Zinzin, uh, Zinzendorf and Christian David, they cut down the first tree, 1722, they start building homes, and Christian David starts going back across the border, bringing back more and more refugees, and soon, Hernhut, which means the watch of the Lord, is being built and established as an incredible community. Now we come to a critical moment, 1726, Zinzendorf has said his kind of comfortable yes, Hernhut is growing, but division hits the community. This is the moment that the dream could end. This is the moment that would make it so that we would never be talking about Zinzendorf or the Moravians 300 years later. This is the defining moment. They are in massive uh, division over theology and practice and how they're going to ordain leaders. They come from different persecuted groups, so they don't all get along. And Zinzendorf looks down on this community and goes, my gosh, the dream is in shambles. So much so that some in the community are even calling Zinzendorf the Antichrist. This is against him, it's personal, and it's against each other. And Zinzendorf will go on to make the hardest, perhaps the hardest yes of his life. He would move over the hill from his wealth, his prestige, his influence. He would lay aside his career as a politician, his career in economics. He would lay it aside all for the dream that this little refugee community could actually change all of human history if he would say the hard yes. He moves into Herrenhut, he begins going house to house, every single home, calling them to brotherly love, calling them to repentance, and they would call the summer of 1727 the sweetest summer that they could ever remember as they reconciled with each other, as they repented and moved into humility and tremendous brotherly love. And you just look at the sacrifice of Zinzendorf. He laid it all aside several times in his life, but this was the one that actually catalyzed the movement so that 300 years later, we're still talking and studying the Moravians and Count Zinzendorf. The end of that summer, they called a love feast to celebrate the newfound unity that they were now sharing. They walked back over that hill that Zinzendorf had moved over to the little chapel on the other side, and they take communion together. And this was August 13th, 1727. And the reason it's so important is because it would go down in history as the Moravian Pentecost. In the middle of communion, the power of God opened over that little chapel. His presence was poured out so much so that they were writing things like in heaven or on earth we did not know. The presence of God moved with profound, tangible power. They knew that they were filled with the Holy Spirit for Holy Spirit empowerment and really the rest was history. This Pentecost sent this little community of refugees that had now found newfound unity with a sacrificial leader who had laid it all down for the sake of their unity and obedience to God. The fire of God would fall on that sacrifice and they would go on to change all of human history and to change the world around them out of the simple obedience that came out of that Moravian Pentecost. It was about four or five days later, and there's many recount, accounts of how the children led the way. They were so moved by this encounter with God and this fire that was burning inside of them that they were found in the fields in prayer. They were, they were hungry for worship, and the whole community became a worship and praying community. In fact, they decided in these early weeks after the Pentecost that they were provoked by the thought that the enemy was standing before the throne of God day and night, accusing the saints. And they were provoked by the, the, the passage in Leviticus that the fire on the altar must never go out. And with these things in mind, they decided, let's start a one-hour prayer rotation that would go all day and all night, seven days a week. So two or three people would take an hour, and then the next, per next two or three, the next hour, and they began a Moravian prayer chain of gritty faith-filled intercession, praying for the lost, the nations of the earth. They had thousands of names and uh, prayer requests and people they were praying for. And it was out of this furnace of intercession that four or five years later, the Moravian missions movement would begin. But I don't want to move too quickly past this Moravian prayer movement. I want you to think for one moment, you know, sometimes our Christianity and our spirituality can be so based on comfort and it can be that the prayer meetings, if the music's right and the people are right and the, the prayer temperament is right, that we're really in. If we have the right coffee and the right ambiance, you know, we can really press in. But I want you to imagine Germany, 1700s. Let's go to January, middle of January, 3 a.m. 
and your buddies have just spent 2 to 3 a.m. praying in cold, middle of the winter, 1700s Germany, and they're shaking you at your bedside, and the last thing you want to do is get out of bed. And it's never going to make Instagram, it's never going to make Facebook, it's never going to be put in a magazine, no one's ever going to know you did it, everyone else is sleeping, and yet you're compelled by the presence and the power of God and the need of broken humanity to pull your body out of that bed on that cold winter's night at three in the morning and to get on your knees and go, God, we're asking that your presence would move in East Africa. God, we're asking, would you move on the hearts of the people in Greenland? And that gritty, raw, unglamorous hour of prayer was linked together with thousands and thousands of hours of intercession that birthed the first real Protestant missions movement. Four or five years later, as I said, uh, Zinzendorf has another divine appointment with a man who had come from the East Indies, who, or sorry, who had come from the Caribbean, the West Indies. And, and it, was out, it was out of that region this man came, and he came with a cry on his heart, will anyone go back to my people to share the gospel? They're in slavery, and they don't know the good news of Jesus Christ. Zinzendorf is cut to the heart. He goes back to Herrenhut. He shares the vision with the people of Herrenhut and says, we've got to go. There are people all over the world that have never heard the good news of Jesus. We can't stay in comfortable heronhood. We can't just stay in our amazing Christian community. It's time to start sending people all over the world. Simultaneously, one of the young men in the community has a dream. In the dream, he sees people crying out from another nation of another ethnicity, crying out for the gospel. He wakes up and he knows in his heart he has to go. Now I want to take you another amazing moment here where Zinzendorf wakes up early in the morning. This is now in the 17, early 1730s, and he gets up before dawn, early in the morning. Why? Because this would be the morning that he commissions and sends out the first two Moravian missionaries. They've never done it before. And we're not talking getting on a plane, getting a nice ticket and a, and a good seat and a good meal and flying to another nation. We're talking putting your belongings in a coffin, getting onto a ship, sailing across an ocean knowing you may never see your family again, but filled with the joy and the delight of taking the gospel to those that have never heard before. The sun begins to rise that morning. Those two young men come to Zinzendorf's home. He prays for them. He lays hands on them. He commissions them. And there was a moment in history where two young men, and it says they had nothing, they had no money, they had barely any supplies whatsoever, walked down a little path in Herrenhut, Germany, on their way to a port city to find a ship to be the first Moravian missionaries. I just want you for a moment to ponder that kind of obedience. Think about walking down the road, that dusty road, that early morning with the sun rising and the prayers of Zinzendorf in your ears, and you're walking down the road into the unknown, yet believing that once again, the power of God would meet a simple yes in the human heart and the rest would be history. Now, this movement of worship, intercession, and this movement of missions would go on to change entire nations of the world and go on to birth the Protestant missions movement that would inspire many others like William Carey and for countless missionaries for hundreds of years to go to the nations of the earth. They were the first to take the gospel to places like Alaska, Greenland, East Africa, um, into some of the slave colonies in, in um, in the Caribbean region. They went all over with one primary slogan on their hearts that the lamb would receive the reward of his suffering. They went and many laid down their lives, but they went in joy. They went in the the excitement and the privilege and the joy of their obedience to God. It was the Moravians who launched this prayer movement, the Moravians who launched this missions movement, all on the power of simple yeses, simple obedience, the power of God, grit and endurance, and 300 years later, we're still being inspired by their story. Okay, before we wrap up this first episode, I just want to end with a couple practical application points. This has got to mess us up. This has to be an impartation. This can't just be stories and inspiration, but that we would be moved into action. Number one, have you ever been confronted with a real need right in front of you like Zinzendorf was with the need of the division among his refugee community? First, they needed a place to live. Then they needed unity and brotherly love. 
What have you been confronted with recently? What do you see in the world around you that we can't just go to bed and pretend like it's not happening? God wants to confront us with the needs and the brokenness around us. And our response to those things are often the things that change human history. Are you willing and are you ready to be confronted in your life by the need and the brokenness around you? Number two is that simple yes. Um, Sometimes it's easy to kind of give a a, a soft yes. You know, there's like altar call moments where the music's perfect and the preacher was amazing. There's kind of short-term sacrifices, but often it's the hard yes that catalyzes the most fruit, the most impact, and draws us deepest into the heart of God. Are you willing today, confronted by the needs around you, to say the difficult yes? For Zinzendorf, it was laying aside his wealth. It was laying aside society's definition of success to go after God's definition of success. Are you willing to say the hard yes today to whatever God would say to you, knowing on the other side of that yes that God is going to meet you with profound power? We don't say this yes in drudgery. We don't say it in like just obligation. Do you have faith in your heart today that before the full word yes even gets out of your mouth. His power is already ready to meet you. His his divine power is already ready to be poured out. He's just waiting for those who will go all in, fully surrender, and say yes to Him. He wants to fill us with that kind of faith today, that it's actually possible to see breakthrough in the nations of the earth, over the injustices on the earth, over our city, over our community, our neighborhoods, our family. Finally, I want to ask today, are we willing to enter into gritty, endurance-based intercession? I'm not saying it won't be joyful. There will be a lot of joyful moments in there. We're talking to the creator of the universe. His beauty and His glory are untapped. We'll never fully understand it. But are we willing to do it when no one's looking? Are we willing to step into intercession when it doesn't feel glamorous? Are we willing to give the hours and log the hours in intercession to see something truly birthed on the earth, whether anyone's aware, whether we're ever able to explain to anyone. We want a history with God that gives us authority to release the kingdom on the earth. And I want to ask today, would we consider upping our game when it comes to gritty, endurance-based intercession? Nothing has ever really been released on the earth of the kingdom without gritty intercession. Our next session, we're going to be talking about John Wesley and the Methodist spiritual awakening. The incredible thing about this is it is directly linked to Zinzendorf and the Moravians and the yes in their hearts. Stay tuned for the next episode.